What's going on everybody and welcome back to Comic Breakdown. In this video, we are going to be jumping into the full video of Fall of the House of X. Now, while most of the other titles in the end of Krokoa era, they're really focusing on the Phoenix, they're focusing on Enigma, but this title is hugely focused on Orcus, on Nimrod, on the downfall of all of them as Nimrod and Omega Sentinel bring in Sentinel City while everybody is focused on exterminating mutant kind. And so, from the trial of Cyclops to the final battle against Nimrod, it is all right here in this full story. Mutant Kind's counter-offensive. Their time to strike back. No longer holding themselves back. No longer stopping them from doing what is absolutely necessary to prevent their extinction. It is time for Mutant Kind to rise up. So, make sure you guys have subscribed to the channel, make sure that you like this video, and with that being said, let's dive into this breakdown. Yeah. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue number one, we pick up in Paris, the same place that Magneto had been tried once. This is where Cyclops' trial will be held, and Orcus has him exactly where they want him. He is on trial in all of Mutandom, they are his co-defendants. Cyclops though is simply playing along, he's giving the Resistance enough time to strike back. And Cyclops is no fool. He knows that the trial is going to go against him. He knows this isn't one he can win. They may lose this battle, but the war, they plan to win. This is where we pick up with Colossus and Wolverine. One thing that the Krakoan Age has brought us is the advancement in mutant technology. By combining mutant powers, we call this a circuit. There is an ongoing consensus among historians that the primordial circuit is mutant technology, really referred to as a fastball special for their advancement. The same name as the physical attack where Colossus pitches Wolverine with uncanny accuracy at its target. This is where we see Colossus throw an Orcus agent. He throws him right down the plate and this Orcus agent lands right in the claws of Wolverine and Colossus with Wolverine discussing what they're gonna call this move. Wolverine suggesting that they call it the Screwball Special, simply cause they were screwed to begin with. But the two of them are underneath the courthouse in Paris. They are preparing to free Cyclops. The mutants have gathered for the rescue, and it is only a matter of time before they put their play into action. Meanwhile, we have Cyclops being interrogated by Dr. Gregor, alongside her Omega Sentinel. Now, Gregor says that she's come here to discuss the war, but Cyclops has to wonder why is Omega Sentinel accompanying you? Gregor going on to let Cyclops know that you guys may have won the battle, but we won the war. Cyclops does believe that she has come for more. He believes that she has come for human interaction with a man experienced with profound grief. And to this, Gregor has nothing to say. This is when Cyclops asks the question, what happens after? When the last mutant is dead under your heels, what then? And Gregor goes on to say that humankind will live happily ever after. And this makes him laugh. Cyclops laughs because he wasn't asking Gregor. He was asking Omega Sentinel. As we pick up in the skies above the courthouse, Charles Xavier is reaching out to Rasputin. He is letting her know that she is needed. At first, she lets him know that her role in rescuing Cyclops, it is a critical role. Not one that she can simply abandon because Charles has a call. But Charles tells her that I can save them all. That together, we can save everybody, but only if you join me right now, right this moment. That we can fix everything. Everything. Rasputin taking him up on this. She leaves the courthouse. She leaves the rescue mission. When Wolverine and Colossus go to call Rasputin, they see that something is off and something is wrong. With a rumbling in the tunnel, there is a huge explosion. Orcus is down here waiting for them. With a giant electromagnet, both Colossus and Wolverine are pinned up against the wall. Taking a flamethrower, they begin to burn Wolverine alive. The Orcus agents laughing with joy, but that joy is quickly interrupted with the arrival of Kurt. Nightcrawler bamfing in, kicking some butt. He is letting them know that Rasputin has disappeared, that perhaps it is time to launch the invasion of Earth. 
that rescuing Cyclops has to come second now. This is where we pick up with the trial. They have come to this court to say mutant kind are nothing more than a menace. They're an evasive foreign species. And when it is time for Cyclops to have his defense, he says absolutely nothing. He refuses to dignify this with any kind of response. He knows humanity can be good, but he refuses to be prosecuted by it. The judge does warn him that if you continue down this path, you are surely going to be found guilty. But in his mind, there is only one person that can truly judge him. And not a single soul is her. This is where we take off to the Orcus Blue. At this point, they're already celebrating. They're already pouring their glasses of champagne. Fei Long, Dr. Stasis, Omega Sentinel, Dr. Gregor, all of them are sitting here ready to have just the time of their life. Believing that this is over, the war is won, this is game over. To put the final nail in the coffin, Omega Sentinel sends Nimrod to kill Krakoa. To end the island once and for all. Now when Nimrod shows up, he thinks this is going to be an easy task. I'm going to take down this island, I'm going to return home, and we're going to build Sentinel City. As Nimrod charges in on the tree. This is when Krakoa spits amber on him. So much amber that Nimrod's systems freeze up. It completely disables him in a single moment. And that's when Krakoa sucks him down into the island. The vines wrapping around Nimrod and the amber. He sends out a distress call. He lets them all know that he has been disabled and they got a runner. This is where Krakoa unroots itself and it takes off. Now in a weakened and diminished state, Krakoa is running for its life. This is when Dr. Gregor goes on to give a speech to the people of the world, letting them know that the next few hours are going to be uncomfortable, that they are finally going to remove the threat of mutant kind, that Krakoa will be eradicated, and the mutants that don't leave the planet, they will be liquefied. This is the final warning to any mutant left on Earth. This is where we pick up with our mutants. Everybody is waiting for Iron Man's big plan to take place. The plan we will see unfold in Iron Man issues 14 and 15. He is executing this plan now. They weren't ready for the invasion yet, but they have no choice now. They must spring their trap now. This is where she is going to drop down. Kitty Pride is going to drop down. Use the gateways because she's the only one that can use gateways. Still unexplained on why, but she's going to use the gateways to communicate with their other forces so they can coordinate their attack. The first person she goes to is Iron Man and Emma Frost. And then she goes to planet Araco. Let's Woofer know that it is time to be ready with Forge's fleet coming from deep space. And Emma Frost sends out a message, letting everybody know that we are fighting earlier than we anticipated. But she has the utmost confidence in all of their abilities. That they will, they must succeed. The whole world is at stake. That they are fighting off extinction. And in the coming hours, everything is about to be determined. This is where we pick up at nowhere. We pick up with Brew, leader of the Brood. Now, Brew is expecting Jean Grey, but the person that arrives is Polaris. And she is asking Brew, are you ready for war? And because Jean Grey had saved Brew's life, saved his entire species, he is ready to fight by the side of mutant kind. And so Polaris and Brew, they head off to war. Alright gang, in this issue, we jump right into the fray. Polaris having that giant celestial head directly behind her. She has made her way right to the doorstep of Orcus. Both Modok and Dr. Stasis, they watch as she comes in. With her powers and the mast of the Celestial, it would overwhelm the Bloom Shields. Dr. Stasis lets us know that the fleet of ships from Morocco, they hid Stark's Sentinel Buster armor. He assumes that this giant celestial skull is the mutant reinforcements. He declares to kill every single mutant that they see. This is when we see the skull crash into the blue. And in the destruction, Polaris boards the blue. Having her shield up, she is only waiting for the attack to begin. 
the Orcus agents had no idea what was coming for them. This is where we see the brood let loose. Now, Polaris, she could have destroyed the station, but she didn't want the Orcus agents to make it to the escape pods. She wanted them to believe that they could hold the station, that they had a chance. So she crippled it, and then she let Brew give the order. This is where we pick up on an Orcus shuttle, being able to launch with some prisoners before the attack. They're not getting any response from command, but the commander of these Orcus agents say that they are going to dock, that they are going to fight, they are going to do whatever it takes to stop the mutants. What they didn't realize is that one of the agents is in fact Colossus. Wolverine breaking free, they make quick work of this team. This is when Nightcrawler shows up helping take care of what members of these agents are left. He lets them know that he has been searching for Firestar. As they get ready to dock, the Orcus agents open fire, only for the Brood to overwhelm them. And nobody expected the Brood to be on board. This was never part of the plan. This is something that Polaris just kinda did on her own. With Polaris asking what they have been up to and what they're doing, what their mission is. Polaris is here to kill Stasis and Firestar, but Nightcrawler is filling her in, letting her know that Firestar has been a double agent, that she has been working for the mutants, and so she's gonna give Nightcrawler a little bit of time, give him an opportunity to find Firestar and save any civilians that can be saved, but she has plans to drop this whole thing into the sun. Down in New York, we have the White Queen herself, the beautiful Emma Frost. She gives a sit rep of what is going on. Shadow Cat in Paris trying to rescue Cyclops. We have Juggernaut who is out there rescuing Krakoa after being brought down with some Sentinels. Juggernaut's coming in with one of Cable's guns. He makes quick work of these Stark Sentinels and he is able to rescue Krakoa. That's when Emma has her own problems. A Stark Sentinel finding her in New York communicating with Rogue, asking if she will go assist Juggernaut in picking him up, getting him and Krakoa out of there. The only problem, Rogue and Gambit have a plan of their own. Rogue sets the plane on autopilot. She sends the jet back to Emma, lets her know that they got their own mission. Of course, Emma's concerned about this, thinking that now is not the time to break ranks. What could be possibly more important than what we have going on? This is when Sink shows up using the powers of Iceman helping bring down the Stark Sentinel, letting her know that if Rogue says she's got something to do, it's gotta be important. Right now, they have Stasis trapped in orbit. They need to neutralize more high-value targets. This is what takes us to the once Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. After everything started to go down, this is where Rogue decided to hide Manifold, to tuck him away from everything and everyone. For Manifold, only a few moments are going to have passed. They know that he's going to be mad. Putting him in stasis in Krakoan no place, it's like being deleted from the universe. As he begins to wake up, Rogue tries to explain, tries to let him know what has been going on, why they had to do what they did. But as he looks up to the stars, he sees how long he has been asleep. And so obviously, no matter how much the two of them try to explain themselves, he loses his temper, blasting Gambit and going to strike Rogue. But when he strikes her, her face breaks off. We see the Mask of Destiny, telling him that the future was unwritten without him. But removing that mask, we learn that this is Latuka, calling Manifold Little Brother. Manifold says that he's always been a little bit cranky after waking up, and they know how deep in it they are right now. Laktuka goes on to explain that these two mutants were sent by someone that has a lesser understanding of the universe in the future than you and I. But nobody sought to wrong you, only to protect you. These X-Men succeeded in changing Manifold's destiny. Laktuka saying that I will see you again. This was almost like a vision. Rogue and Gambit standing before him, still trying to explain themselves. But he says it's okay. He says that he understands. But now they must go where they are needed. And so he asks the universe to deliver them where they need to be. And in the blink of an eye, they are gone. 
This is what takes us back up to the Orca Station. We have Wolverine that is chasing down Dr. Stasis. But Dr. Stasis, he is lucky enough to get onto an escape pod. He is able to break out of here. And then Modok shoots Wolverine in the back, telling the X-Men that he does admire the fact that they used the brood against them. And he takes this opportunity to get out of here. Then we have Polaris, Colossus, and Nightcrawler looking for Logan. Telling Brute to get his entire people back to nowhere. Nowhere is going to stabilize in orbit. But the Bloom is going to crash down to Earth. She is aiming it towards the Southern Ocean. But the team was also unable to find Firestar. At this exact moment, down in Paris, Omega Red has Cyclops on his knees. Sword in hand, ready to behead him. She says that she argued that he didn't need a trial, but the human friends in Orcus insisted. But now she is ready to finish this job, as she gets ready to cut him down. This is when Omega Sentinel is stunned. Dr. Gregor. Out of left field, nobody expected her to be the one to show up to save Cyclops. But she makes all of this quick, saying that that was only a small EMP that she could use once. That Omega Sentinel will reboot any second, they have to act quickly. What Cyclops had said to her in prison, she thinks there might have they might have a problem with a secret part of Orcus. That there's a part of the organization she hasn't been able to access after her husband and her brought Nimrod online but there is a huge amount of resources that have no oversight both on earth and in space asking Cyclops what does he know about Sentinel City gang so as we dive into this issue we are starting it off with Juggernaut he is tasked with protecting Krakoa at all costs and that is exactly what he is doing as Juggernaut drags Krakoa behind him through the desert this is when Orcus arrives confiscating one of the shield's hella carriers. It was only a matter of time before the Orcus caught up, slowing down Juggernaut by shooting him in the leg with a harpoon made of adamantium, repurposed metal from the corpses of Wolverine. Juggernaut using his body to shield Krakoa. The Orcus agents are unleashing hell. In all of this, Juggernaut has found himself more angry than he has ever been. Surviving the attack from the Hellfire Gala, he is sworn to protect Krakoa at all costs. To wait for the reinforcements. This is where we pick up with Dr. Gregor and Cyclops. We have found that these two are now working together with Dr. Gregor putting down Omega Sentinel. And these two are headed inside the Orcus facility. Cyclops has come to the understanding that the AI is the biggest problem they have right now. Because their goals are much bigger than just killing mutants. And Cyclops must ask the question to Dr. Gregor, who controls Orcus? Who really controls it? Now for a while, she believed that they did, that the humans did. But now it is looking like Omega Sentinel and Nimrod have been doing their own thing. The humans, Orcus, are slowly starting to understand this, but it's already too late. This is when magic shows up, bringing Cyclops a visor. Cyclops is letting Magic know that everything going on with the AI is just too quiet. He wants to go after Nimrod. He wants to find out where he is, what he is up to. While he investigates further, we pick up on the planet Arako. Apocalypse is letting all the mutants know that the mutants of Earth have raised their war banners. A united and reforged Arako is going to join the fight. With Woofer being the first one to say that he's from Chicago and he is more than ready to take the fight to them. But he does wonder how they're getting back to Krakoa. All of the gateways are down. And where is Storm? Apocalypse says that there's still magic left in all of these worlds. When it comes to Storm, like a storm, she can be hard to predict. But with a giant boom and a blinding light, we have the arrival of Manifold. Teleporting himself in with Rogue and Gambit as well as Sword Station. This is how the mutants are getting to Earth. Manifold being one that loathes war, but knows now is the time. It is the time for all mutants to fight back, to stand up, to take back what belongs to them. 
all who board Sword Station, they go to their deaths. Not everyone will make it through the night. It will be a bloody and hellish battle. But today, the invasion begins. With everybody getting on board, Sword Station teleports right next to Sword Station number two. The two stations creating a giant X in the sky. This is where Apocalypse, Rogue, and all of the others begin their assault. As they begin their descent, Rogue cannot help but what Destiny had told her. That there would be a day like this. So much death and destruction. And it all accumulates with a giant X in the heavens. With the fall of the Krakoans. She sees kings clashing in white, black after the death of the Red Queen, a Jovian bolt from the heavens, the stars ripped in half, the poisoning lies of the false captain, the fool who speaks the truth and will pay the price. Destiny's prophecy is coming true, taking us down to Juggernaut still protecting Krakoa, with the sword stations appearing in orbit. The Orcus agents look up and they know they are screwed. Emma and Shadowcat coming down for the rescue. They get a transmission from Firestar, saying that if they get this, she might be dead, but Dr. Stasis realized she was a double agent, but she was able to put a tracker on him. She asked them to punch his ticket. As they reroute, they head to the middle of nowhere. Shadowcat and Emma Frost now confronting Dr. Stasis before he takes off in his jet. A man that was confident he was going to win. He was going to hop on that private plane and Dr. Stasis would cease to exist for a few years. And Dr. Stasis lets the ladies know that if you lay a finger on me, you will never see Firestar again. That he has hidden her away for insurance for this exact situation. With the finest blockers implanted in his head. The only problem, Shadowcat put her hand through his head and disabled the blocker, took it out. That means Emma Frost can do her thing. Sending the location of Firestar to sink and sink in close proximity to Firestar already. He is able to grab hold of her powers and do so naturally without straining himself. Getting to the ship that she is aboard, he knocks down the Orcus agents. He opens up the casket only to see that Firestar is being kept alive through some kind of life support. Taking it off, she wakes up. And Dr. Stasis is now at the mercy of Emma Frost. And what Emma Frost does is make him live his worst fears. His most unhinged nightmares. It only took a minute for Dr. Stasis' heart to begin to arrest. But time is relative. With a skilled telepath like Emma Frost, she made this feel like 10 years. Watching himself die time and time and time again. Seeing the mutants absolutely destroy him. And this is when Firestar comes in. Emma and Shadowcat had been debating on how to kill Dr. Stasis, but Firestar had other plans. She comes in and she fries him to a crisp. Now we're gonna hop over to the moon. The old summer's home on the moon. This is where Nimrod set up base. Cyclops letting Magic know to have Emma keep an ear out just in case something goes down here. As he begins to investigate, trying to figure out why Nimrod would even come here to begin with. This is when Dr. Gregor mentions Sentinel City. After their victory over Krakoa, the habitats on the moon, they were really changed into relay stations. All for the mining settlement, except most of the ore never made it back to Earth. It was used on site. It was used right here. Dr. Gregor opening up a door. This is where we see Nimrod plugged into a computer, letting Emma Frost to be ready. Dr. Gregor tries to talk to Nimrod, the thing that was once her husband. She thinks maybe she can reach it. Maybe she can talk to it. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Nimrod grabs Dr. Gregor's head and twists it 180 degrees. He snaps her neck and that is when Cyclops attacks. Nimrod says that they calculated what their chances of success would look like. The best chances, the greatest chances came when mutants and humans were at each other's throats. They would be so busy fighting one another, nobody would look up. No one would see the sword overhead. Sentinel City is not an outpost. It is not a mine. It is a tool to sterilize the entire planet once and for all. Alright gang, so as we dive into this issue, we pick up on Earth. 
We're in the American Southwest. We have a ragtag team of Iraqi and deported Krakoan mutants. They arrive on the battlefield and just in the nick of time. Before us stands Apocalypse. Covered in his own blood, but none of it his. He has cut down the best that Orcus has ever had. He is showing no mercy, because right now he is cutting his way to Krakoa, the island nothing more than the size of a tree right now. Two Stark Sentinels trying to rip off Krakoa's arms. And that is when Apocalypse comes in. He puts down these Stark Sentinels like they are nothing. And Apocalypse is enraged. The pampered and perfumed so-called leaders of the mutant nation, they abandon Krakoa. They let Krakoa starve, all while they were playing both sides or hiding in mansions, scurrying about like rats in tunnels. And now Krakoa sitting at Apocalypse's feet. Krakoa is dying, and Apocalypse refuses to let this happen. Cutting open his own arm and putting this blood into the mouth of Krakoa, he feeds the island. He feeds the mutants, doing this all in a hopes that Krakoa may be saved. This is what picks us up with Cyclops at the moon. Looking like Cyclops is about to meet his end, Nimrod teleporting out. Just in the nick of time, Magic is able to get there and get both of them out of there before Nimrod detonates the place. And while Nimrod sits here and he contemplates all of this, he is a killing machine that can be in multiple places at one time. Mutants cannot account for this. His secret weapon to pacify all the illings of Earth was rising. That of course was Sentinel City. This is where Omega Sentinel gets in contact with him and lets him know that he needs to get back and he needs to do it now because they have a visitor. Charles Xavier has joined the machines and he has an offer that they are going to want to hear. Charles Xavier joined Nimrod. Charles Xavier switched sides. Like, I want you guys to sit on that for a minute. Charles Xavier just switched sides. And in the next page, we get a data page explaining exactly what he is planning to do. He believes that the AIs are going to win. He does not have faith. He does not have hope any longer. His dream has always been Krakoa. He is asking for Nimrod and Omega Sentinel to let him remove mutants from the board. That they're playing an all or nothing game. Taking mutants out of the equation gives them a higher probability of winning that game. That he wants mutantdom to live in peace on Krakoa and they will not interfere with the machine's designs. All with the threat of death. Of course, Nimrod doesn't believe that they'll ever accept this, but Xavier does think so. He will will it to be so. And asking Nimrod, have you ever considered what will happen when you succeed? When mutants and humans are wiped from the planet, what will you become? You have nothing to fear from mutants living in peace on Krakoa. And if that ever changes, he trusts that Nimrod will teach his children the lesson that he has learned. That mutant kind has limitations. And at this point, Nimrod is almost willing to agree. It seems like they are about to seal the deal on this offer. To really close it in, Charles Xavier says that there is an American launching a nuclear capable vessel that he will handle this. And while he may not be able to handle some of his former students because he taught them the Red Triangle defense, Nimrod says that he will handle them, that he will do what must be done. With Charles accepting, Charles Xavier has made himself the enemy. This is what takes us to Apocalypse. He says that they are going to do what must be done, that there is still strength in their blood. If Krakoa is to bloom again, his roots must be nourished. Krakoa feeds off of mutant energy. They grew so large in accommodating all of them, and now Krakoa has been starving since the night of the Hellfire Gala. And so the first sacrifice steps forward. An Iraqi born, seen his fair share of battles throughout all of these ages, mutant and proud. But this story is near the end, and he wishes for glory. With Apocalypse witnessing him, he tells the warrior to come forward. He strikes at Apocalypse, and then Apocalypse smashes his face in. A glorious death for a glorious cause. But this single death will not be enough for Krakoa to set roots. That there must be more to step forward. This is where we have Wrong Slide. After being in Otherworld and being resurrected, he came back as Wrong Slide. 
a completely new and different person. Wrong Slide may not have lived long, but he is mutant energy. Maybe even enough so that nobody else has to die. And so with him stepping forward, Apocalypse lets him know that the two of them are now joined in a duel to the death for this broken land. With the sun getting tremendously bright, some saying that it is going Nova, Apocalypse already knows that it's the machines, that that is not their fight. Wrong Slide, Apocalypse charging at one another, the Crucible beginning to stabilize Krakoa, and above Earth, this is where we have our X-Men team. They are just now learning about the structure that is in front of the sun. They are learning about Sentinel City. Emma Frost also recognizes the few humans left inside Orcus. They have just enacted the Red Triangle Defense. That would mean Xavier has done something. This is when Charles has a conversation with Cyclops taking him back to the mansion as Charles goes on to explain that this is going to be difficult for him to hear that hard choices had to be made and so he made a deal Cyclops loses it telling him that they could have won but again Charles does a backroom deal and then everyone just has to live with his decisions he tells him to cut to the end who gets to live who gets to die Hoping the Cyclops would have understood him, he says that he won't apologize for what he has done and what he needs to do. That right now, he needs Orcus to trust him, and he wants Cyclops to trust him as well. That in order for mutants to survive, at least for now, no more humans. This is where we see that ship that had the nuclear weapon on it, it detonates. All at the hands of Charles. Cyclops using his red triangle defense. He says that it didn't have to be this way, but he can't focus on that right now. Right now, they don't have nearly enough X-Men, but they're gonna do with what they have. They are gonna take this station directly into Sentinel City. They need to destroy it, and they have to do it now. But not Emma. She has to stay back. If they don't make it home, someone has to face off against Charles. And now Manifold can see much more clearly. He is here to raise their sword. He tells everyone to take a deep breath and get ready. Down on Earth, we have Apocalypse and Wrong Slide. These two have been going blow for blow. The whole time, Apocalypse has been holding back. Wrong Slide reminds him of the lost land, of the man that he once was. That Wrong Slide holds wonder in his heart. And above all, Wrong Slide treasures life. But he knows this requires death. And so no longer holding back, he takes Wrong Slide and he breaks him, saying his last words, his last wish, that if Wrong Slide ever comes back, to let him know it was good to be for a while. But now it is time for Rock Slide to be again, to enjoy it all for him. As Apocalypse rips him to pieces, Krakoa takes it all in and takes a deep gas coming back to life. As we pick up with the X-Men fully enthralled in battle with Nimrod and Omega Sentinel. Crashing the station directly into Sentinel City. Nimrod knew that they would attack, but not that they would teleport the entire station into the city. But they have only delayed the inevitable. As Nimrod knocks away on Colossus and the others. He tells them that they have already won. That they must accept this truth. But Nimrod also has like an existential crisis here, saying that perhaps it will not end here. Maybe this won't be their end. They are all electricity. This is their single commonality. Maybe the energy within them will transfer to a place where their existences do not overlap. And so Nimrod has to think more on this. Are there places yet undiscovered where he can keep killing? What is he when he accomplishes his task? A bigger problem that they have is Nightcrawler aboard Sentinel City, sabotaging all the repair efforts. And there's also a very powerful storm headed their way. A storm not coming from the sun, one that is coming from Earth. It is said that in space, screams go unheard. But they say that that is untrue. If one is able to cocoon oneself in oxygen and lightning, then blistering across the void in the solar tempest, if you can do that, then your scream of vengeance will ring across the galaxy. And entering the battle, the goddess storm.
Alright gang, so we're jumping right into the fray. We have Nimrod giving Wolverine one heck of a beatdown. Even though Sentinel City has been destroyed, Nimrod is holding out that there is still a chance. That they have only prolonged the inevitable. That it will now be a much darker and much brutal time moving forward. We also cannot forget that Nimrod is in multiple places at one time. Multiple bodies fighting the X-Men all over the place. From New York City to Washington DC, but they all work as one unit. Fighting against Wolverine, Emma Frost in another place, Polaris in another, and then joined by Magneto. He lets Nimrod know that this is the day he's going down. That he had underestimated him before, but he won't make that mistake again. As they prepare for their attack, we have Sink using the powers of Sunfire to try and soften up Nimrod. And then Emma Frost trying to knock his armor loose. And though they fight against him, he cannot understand why they would continue. In his mind, he won this months ago. As we pick up with Nightcrawler and Cyclops. As they get out of the wreckage of Sentinel City, Nightcrawler has to teleport away to go and save Colossus, who is flying through space. Nimrod hit him so hard that he went up into outer space and he kept going, with Psylocke having a small little eye on him, barely able to see him. Nightcrawler is able to go save him, and Cyclops faces off against Nimrod. Meanwhile, when we pick up with Omega Sentinel, her party is getting crashed by Rogue and Psylocke. With Omega Sentinel so focused on Rogue, she never saw Psylocke coming in from behind her and using her dagger, piercing through the mind of the machine. She thought that this would kill her, but it didn't. All it did was destroy the machine part of her, the AI. The only thing that is left over is what was once human, with them deciding to leave her in her agony, dealing with the pain of everything that she has done, drowning in the sorrow, the regret. The part of her brain that was Karima had been partitioned away for so very long, taking us back over to Cyclops and Nimrod, with magic knocked unconscious, Eden as well. We see Cyclops use his blast and hit Nimrod. And every one of those endless simulations which came to the end of the XG, Cyclops was the Omega Mutant, the last one standing. His gift had the ability to crack Nimrod's armor, but Nimrod had been learning, grabbing hold of Cyclops. He tells them that he is the toughest of all of them, and he's not sure if he's going to see him in what they would consider a next life. But if there is one, Nimrod will follow him. He will hunt him down in any and every life. As we see each of the Nimrods holding on to one of the X-Men. Sink, Emma Frost, Polaris, Magneto, and Cyclops. Getting ready to break their necks. This is where we have the arrival of the goddess herself. Storm comes in with her lightning bolt and she hits Nimrod. A billion calculations only to be wrong about the last X-Men standing. This is the most humanity that Nimrod would ever achieve. This affecting every one of the duplicate Nimrods, a flaw that he did not perceive. Being able to exist and think across vast distances requires a lot of data and power. This is something the Storm really manipulated and exploited. So all of the Nimrods currently are feeling that electrical flow through their body, disabling them, putting them down. But they have yet to fully go down. So this is where Polaris and Magneto, they use their powers together and they help out the goddess. As Storm prepares to put down Nimrod, we see that Storm is trying to show some kind of mercy to him. She tells him that if you stop fighting right now, this war it ends. If the X-Men stop fighting, they die. That this is the huge difference between the two of them. As they battle and Storm uses lightning bolts to take him on, Cyclops is able to crack open his armor. This is when the goddess commands the lightning and forces it into Nimrod's body, unwielding to yield. Sink reaches out and uses Storm's power, helping her out as well. Magneto and Polaris creating a magnetic field. The storm that Nimrod had faced even wiped out all of his duplicates, including all of the ones that were hidden away from combat. Nimrod's last words, You vermin will follow me into the abyss. With the battle being won and the X-Men gathering everybody together, they prepare to get out of here. 
with Prodigy asking the universe to open up and teleport them away. All of the X-Men get out of here, except along the way, Eden and Scott get grabbed up. Eden not knowing where they are, what is going on, he looks up and what he sees is Laktuka greeting little brother. Laktuka had taken them away from the threat that is currently happening, the threat of Enigma. If Enigma looks in their direction, the only thing that they will see is the void of the cosmos. They would be unable to see Laktuka, Eden, Scott, or anybody else, at least within the vicinity of Laktuka. And Eden knows that if she is here, they are in good hands. But the universe is on a precipice, and Scott Summers' heart, that will tip the scales away from death and towards life. This is where our heroes pick up on Krakoa. Krakoa is still alive and all thanks to Apocalypse. He informs them that the island was in hibernation, but it will now welcome all of their energies here. Before they go off and celebrate, Scott takes a moment. Not sure if Jean can hear him, but he reaches out. He lets her know that they take, they've taken care of Orcus. They broke everything. Nimrod is gone, but they need her to rise again. All of it always goes back to Nathaniel Essex. He is out there threatening all of them. Latuka had told him that his heart will save all of them, but he gave his heart to Jean Grey. He now hopes that love will save them. He knows that she can't reply, but he hopes that she can hear him. He tells her to come back and to bring the fire. And that will be the end of this issue. So let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Definitely a fun and interesting way to deal with Nimrod. Now in the Sins of Sinister timeline, we saw a few variations of how this could go down. This is definitely on the more extreme aspect of things. But we do have multiple Nimrods here. Duplicates all over the place, really at the same power level as one another. Their only flaw is that they are all connected. This connection allowed Storm to fry not just one, but all of them. But we got to see our heroes shine bright, working in unison, working as a circuit, taking down Nimrods all over the globe. And so the battle has been won. Orcus has been defeated. The Stark Sentinels have fallen from the sky. And while they celebrate this victory, the Great War is on the horizon. The war for everything in existence. The war for everything that would matter. The only weapon that is out there that could help them, that is the Phoenix. Hope Summers just recently sacrificing herself, becoming what she was born to always be. Fathered by the Phoenix through Jean Grey, she became the Messiah she was prophesied to be. The next battle will be the Phoenix versus Enigma. So let me know your thoughts, let me know your theories. If you want to get caught up on everything going on with this era of X-Men, check out the link in my description as well as the top of this video. It is going to get you completely caught up on everything going on with this series. If you would like to support the channel, you can always do so by joining the channel membership. Much like Patreon, having multiple different tiers, from $1 to $50, from loyalty badges to comics every single month. Not only are you helping out the channel tremendously, but you are getting tons of perks in the process. Now, if you're unable to do this, do me a favor, subscribe to the channel, like this video, hit that notification bell, and with that being said, until the next breakdown.